Welcome to the Smart Cards video tutorial on the GED Reasoning Through Language Arts practice test. This tutorial is a review of the material on the test and it's also going to give you an idea of what you should be studying for as well as what you can expect when you take the test. So let's get started. Which quotation from the passage, Lessons on the Savannah, supports the idea that Supit is teaching the narrator a skill that requires patience? Let's look at paragraph 15 on page 3. And I quote, For several minutes he stood perfectly still, looking at the zebras beneath the acacia tree. Then he began to move very slowly in their direction. His movement reminded me of the mimes I had seen in Central Park. Each step was exaggerated and painfully slow. Sometimes he froze mid-step, holding his leg up for several minutes, before putting his foot gently on the ground. The closer he got to the zebras, the slower he went. Twice I took my eyes off of him and had trouble finding him again. Paragraph 15 is an illustration of Supit's superior patience. Additionally, the line which reads, each step was exaggerated and painfully slow, aligns itself with answer option B. Which fact can the reader infer about the narrator? He is experienced in working with animals, he is in a hurry to reach his next destination, he was nervous about traveling in the savannah, or he was raised in the city rather than in the wilderness. Given the narrator's previous comment about watching mimes in Central Park in New York City, we can conclude that he was probably raised in the city rather than in the wilderness. This would give us answer option D. Which definition best matches the use of the word occupied in paragraph 16. Let's look at paragraph 16. Specifically, quote, I waited for Supit to rush in on them, but instead he moved even more slowly. In fact, the only way I could tell he was moving was by looking at the spot he had previously occupied. In this context, occupied is referring to the space that Supit had previously been in. That would align itself with answer option B. In this excerpt, Annie asks Marilla to call her Cordelia. What does this request reveal about Annie? Answer option A, she tries to make her life more interesting. Answer option B, she wishes she could fit in better with her peers. Answer option C, she feels confused about her own past. Or answer option D, she hesitates to share personal details. Let's look at page four of the text, specifically line 18 and line 20. Here are the reasons why Annie prefers to be called Cordelia. She says it's such a perfectly elegant name, and she also says that Annie is such an unromantic name. Given these two pieces of evidence, we can conclude that Annie tries to make her life just a little bit more interesting. This would align itself with answer option a. Drag and drop the events into the chart to show the order in which they occur in the excerpt. Here's a summary of the excerpt and of Green Gables. Miss Marilla made arrangements to adopt a little boy. She sends Matthew Cuthbert to the train station to pick up the little boy. Instead, he finds Anne. He couldn't leave Anne at the train station, so he brings Anne to Miss Marilla. When Miss Marilla sees Anne, she's very disappointed because she was expecting a little boy. She and Matthew Cuthbert exchange words. Anne witnesses this and she becomes very sad and begins to cry because she realizes that she's not wanted. Miss Marilla tells Anne not to cry and that she could stay the night and they'll decide what to do the next day. That's when Miss Marilla and Anne have a discussion about what name Anne wants to be called. This is the proper sequence of events. Drag and drop each word that describes Anne into the character web. I think we can all agree that Anne is not practical, nor is she satisfied based on the excerpt Anne of Green Gables. That would mean Anne could be described as dramatic or enthusiastic or disappointed. The letter below is incomplete. Navigate to each select button and choose the option that correctly completes the sentence. 
The letter is written to Ellen Gardner, the CEO of Skyview PC Incorporated, located in San Marte, California. Dear Ms. Gardner, my wife and I have been loyal owners of Skyview computers for over 10 years. We are currently on our third Skyview laptop computer, which we purchased three months ago. We appreciate your competitive prices that allow us to upgrade every few years. Also, we have always been delighted with the compatibility of Skyview products with software we use for our home-based business. The speed and power of our Skyview products have been, and this is where we fill in the blank. This task requires you to identify two independent clauses and the grammatically correct way to join them. Independent clauses are standalone complete sentences and can be joined by a semicolon or by a period. First, let's identify the two independent clauses. The first is the sentence, the speed and power of our Skyview products have been outstanding. The second independent clause is, your products are always well suited to our needs. Again, independent clauses can be joined by a semicolon or by a period. Option B joins these two independent clauses with a period. That would be the correct answer option. Continuing on with the letter, just last week, however, our new laptop began to freeze almost every time we logged on. My wife called the Skyview help desk and received advice from five different advisors. She followed their recommendations, but the computer continues to freeze. I researched the problem and found that Skyview laptops in our serial number range have a history of freezing up, just as ours is doing. None of the advisors with whom my wife spoke acknowledged this problem. Each asked for the serial number of our machine, but never mentioned that there is an ongoing problem which needs to be resolved. I called Skyview again this morning, and this is where we fill in the blank. This task requires you to have knowledge of dangling or misplaced modifiers. For instance, let's look at answer option A. The phone call lasted about 20 minutes asking for help with my problem. The subject of the sentence is the phone call. The predicate of the sentence is asking for help with my problem. When we put the subject and predicate together, we get the phone call was asking for help with my problem. I didn't know a phone call could talk. This is what's known as a dangling modifier. A modifier dangles when the subject and predicate are unclear. Now let's look at answer option C. The phone call lasted about 20 minutes as I asked for help with my problem. The subject is clear, the predicate is clear, answer option C is correct. Continuing on with the letter, the representative with whom I eventually spoke directed me to take our laptop to a repair facility 30 miles from our home. I mentioned the information I had learned and was told that there is a shortage of the parts necessary for repair. Because of this shortage, he said the repair could take up to two months. This is not acceptable. My wife and I conduct business from home and need daily access to our computer. We believe it is unreasonable for Skyview to ask us to transport our computer at our expense for repairs that could take weeks when the problem is obviously not our fault. We are also disappointed that we had to and this is where we fill in the blank. This task requires you to have knowledge of parallel structure. Parallel structure or parallelism matches nouns with nouns, verbs with verbs, adjectives with adjectives, and so on. Let's look at answer option A. Make six phone calls, two emails, and doing our own research. Make is a verb, two is a noun, and doing is a noun. This violates parallelism. Let's look at answer option C. Make six phone calls, write two emails, and do our own research. Make is a verb, write is a verb, and do is a verb. This supports parallelism. Hence, answer option C is correct. Continuing on with the letter, before we learn the truth of our situation. Is this an example of Skyview's customer service philosophy? We would like to give Skyview the opportunity to remedy this situation. We firmly believe that Skyview needs to stand behind its products. If our laptop has a problem which makes it unusable, Skyview should immediately replace it with one that works with as little inconvenience to, and this is where we fill in the blank. This task requires you to match pronouns. 
In the last paragraph, the author uses the pronoun we to refer to his wife and himself. Hence, the proper matching pronoun would be us or answer option B. A summary of Harry S. Truman's 1947 speech on civil rights. President Truman mentioned the United Nations Commission on Human Rights during his speech to the NAACP in order to show which of the four answer options. Let's first understand what the United Nations is. The United Nations is an international organization that is tasked with maintaining peace and security, developing friendly relations, and achieving cooperation with the other world nations. This aligns itself rather closely with answer option B, his general support of civil rights abroad. However, we need additional evidence from the article which will indicate his support for civil rights in the United States. When we look on page two of the article, we find this additional evidence. We see that the president urged Americans to work closely together to repair racial schisms. We see that he asserted that the government should provide for and protect all of its citizens. We see that he indicated that all Americans should possess decent homes, adequate medical care, worthwhile employment, and the right to a fair trial. All of this additional evidence aligns itself with answer option B. What approach did Eleanor Roosevelt take to encourage acceptance of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Did she suggest that nations in disagreement with her stance be removed from the commission? Did she warn of the problems that would occur if all nations had different civil rights policies within their borders? Did she acknowledge the difficulty of convincing different nations to agree on common ideas of democracy and power? Or did she compare the abstaining nations with the voting nations and suggest that the difference between them were insignificant? Let's look on page five of the article to find the evidence we need to support our conclusion. From page five, we can see that there were four nations that abstained from a vote of acceptance of the bill. Drawing attention to these nations, Eleanor Roosevelt did acknowledge the difficulties in deciding upon universal definitions of human rights and the bill's conception of democracy. This aligns itself with answer option C. An analysis of daylight saving time. The article represents arguments from both supporters and critics of daylight saving time who disagree about the practice's impact on energy consumption and safety. In your response, analyze both positions presented in the article to determine which one is best supported. Use relevant and specific evidence from the article to support your response. Type your response in the box below. You should expect to spend about 45 minutes in planning, drafting, and editing your response. I have included an easy template for writing an essay. It's gonna be about five paragraphs with an introductory paragraph, a concluding paragraph, and about three to five paragraphs in the body. The body paragraphs are gonna be fuller expositions of your supporting details in your introductory paragraph, and the concluding paragraph is just a restatement of your position. Want a hard copy of this tutorial? Send an email to smartcardsquestions at yahoo.com and we'll send you a downloadable copy of this tutorial. It's going to have all of the answers to each question as well as our easy to follow template for writing an essay. Start your GED test journey with Smart Cards today. Good luck and don't forget to subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscribe button.